Welcome to the dark forest Jackie and her pals will never bore us Shameless confessions about our obsession Will make us laugh and smile So let's explore the dark forest And dork down for a while Hello and welcome to the dork forest It's me, Jackie Cation You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com If you like a determiner You can donate to the show using PayPal or Venmo. You go to the websites, you find out where I'm doing stand-up comedy. Rangers of the Dork Forest, I love you dearly, and thank you so much. Feel free to go to Apple, rate and review the show. Five stars would be great. Let's do the credits. Mike Rickberg sang and wrote that song that you just heard, and he will be singing at the end, the Mexican hat dance. Uh, Patrick Brady is going to fix this audio and video, and we thank all the stars for that. Let's get into the show. Rangers of the Dork Forest, I have with me Minister Faust. Uh, Yeah, Minister Faust. That's right. We're of an age. His name's Minister Faust, except for that's not his name. But by God, that's his name. So my name's Jackie Cation. You're listening to the Dork Forest. I can't remember if there's an ad in the middle of this one. Look forward to me finding, both of us, finding out later. Anyway, um, Minister uh, Mr. Faust, Jackie Cation here. By the way, if you go to ministerfaust.com, M I N I S T E R F A U S T dot com, you will find that. Uh, so you have a creative writing course and you have novels. You have uh, right. fiction. Yes. Welcome to the show, by the way. Thank you. I feel very welcomed. And well, you ought. Uh, and what? So, so the the creative writing course is where you you help people who want to write novels or who want to write. And so there's going to be creative writing courses that are, that will start soon after this uh, drops. So go yeah, to ministerfaust.com. Yeah. Depending on when this show is on, it might already be on by that point. The courses are called Write Like a MF. And right. So, you know, which is good advice in general. And so uh, I've been... MF writing- stands for Masters in Fine Arts, or Pretty close. Something <laughs> similar to that. We'll we'll go with that one. It's an I'm a knee slapper. That's what I am. This is a <laughs> knee slapping podcast that you've joined. <laughs> I, so, yeah, I gotta say I am I I've only li- I've listened to so many of your podcasts. This is the first time I've seen you on camera with the podcast, and I am very charmed that you don't have a mic stand. Oh, I have a mic stand. I just I uh, it, I'm not used to a mic stand, and it's not. I actually bought one of those arms, the swinging arm. And that mic, uh, I don't know, 18 years of doing podcasts. Let me tell you something. Uh, I got a lot of crap around this house. If anyone were to need, uh, uh, a, the, the arm is the junk, except for that the mic actually was a piece of junk in the end, too. The whole thing, $300, could have lit it on fire, and it was a bit of a drag. But this, for those of you who are uh, at audio techs, it's an SM58, you guys. It's a sure SM58, which uh, I believe is either the $25 initial one that I bought or a $100 one. That teacup is amazing. I'm going to. That is beautiful. What, I, I thank you for noticing. And that is a very nice uh, New York uh, glass you got there. Right here is a pint glass with the, with the subway system on it. And uh, so you guys go to the YouTube channel, check out this fascinating, uh, the imagery. Uh, so, uh, um, but you, uh, so do you have, what? how many novels have you, have you written? Um, I know we're not talking about your dorkdom yet, but you yeah. do love writing. So Why not? it's cool. Sure. So uh, five that are published and then there's a book of short stories. And then I've got some unpublished stuff, including a sequel to my first big one was called The Coyote Kings of the Space Age Bachelor Pad. <laughs> and so I'm finally work- finally working on a sequel to that one. So, you know, you and I were Generation X. It's about gener- Generation X, you know, young men. This was going back because it's, it's a technically it's a period piece. It's set in 1995, came out in okay. 2004. And it's about two young men, too smart for their own good. We were always called slackers, couldn't get the proper <laughs> employment. And then they, you know, and they're fans, they're fanboys, right? So they, it's, and this was, I wrote this at a time before the awesome victory of fan culture permeated pop culture, right? Oh, right, right. When, when we were still being shoved in lockers and now, now it's all mainstream. 
Not yes. jocks or nerds. Nerds yeah. or jocks. Everybody gets to enjoy it. And we don't have to say like, oh, I liked it when it was cool. We could just be glad that we won. You know, the war is over. <laughs> <laughs> so. Right. It turns out it's a cash cow. And uh, and so they marketed it to everybody, including the ladies. Yes. Uh, exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so these guys, the Coyote Kings, they're fans this, uh, of all this stuff. They talk about it. They live it. And then they make the wonderful and horrifying discovery that magic is real, which naturally just about destroys their lives. Oh, sure. It turns out magic could be a terrible idea in, in real life. Um, it actually, in most fictional life, it ends up poorly. <laughs> so... But in badly written television, it turns out that it's no problem. You know, you can just bring no. people back from the dead and, and nobody cares. It's fine. You know, if no. you're the crow, you, you get murdered and your girlfriend's murdered and you wake up a year later and you're not rotten and you don't think, my God, there's life after death. You think, kill. Uh, here's my least favorite thing. Uh, Morbius. It's like he has some sort of bat radar. Yeah, it's called sonar. It's called sonar. I'm going to knife a writer. In, in their sleep, uh, it is madness because the first trailer said he has sonar. And obviously they thought we're going to dumb it down, forgetting that their fan base are a crime, uh, just a pile of um, actually nerds over here. Uh, um, actually, uh, it's called sonar. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, OK, so you have you have I have seen some of this and I've heard of some of it. But but talk. I'm I'm gonna actually start from the one that I have never heard of, which is Princess Kaguya. Oh, Kaguya, Princess Kaguya. Yeah, there we go. So we're talking about a stu classic Studio Ghibli movie of the last uh, several years. I guess maybe about ten years ago, something like that. Okay. It's Studio Ghibli, the best known anime studio in North America. Like in other words, North Americans. That's the one they're most likely to know. Japan is lots. Right. And so uh, the great director, Isao Takahata. So everybody knows uh, uh, Miyazaki, but yes. Isao Takahata was actually his mentor and like who was a senior director. And somehow he kind of got Stan Lee a little bit. I think, you know, he became the oh, less okay. well-known guy. But I mean, I love Miyazaki, but Isao Takahata, brilliant. And so great movies such as um, Grave of the Fireflies, one of the most just the film destroyed me. I mean, it left me in tears. I couldn't believe Wait. Like, for like half an hour. The film was Wait, devastating. Okay. So this is a, so Ghibli, which I know Ghibli, but yeah. only because of Miyazaki. Yeah. And what's the name of the other, the, what's the name of this yeah. enormously famous <laughs> director? <Yeah. laughs> well, his given name, Isao, so I-S-A-O, okay. and then his family name, Takahata, so T A. K A H A T A Takahata, I think. Okay, so all right. So, and he did Grave of the Fireflies and the Princess. Princess, uh, Tale of Princess Kaguya, and he did also the Great Pompoko, which is like a, a, an ecological, com comedic movie in which ah. raccoons oh. fight humanity, like specifically developers, to try to protect their ecosystem. It's hilarious. Oh, and it's as if the rats of Nim got mad. Yeah. That is a great comparison. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And 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 I mean, as much as I love the secret of Nim, like you seriously, this is a, an even better movie. And so you gotta you gotta see his stuff. So Yeah. This sounds amazing. Is Grave of the Fireflies the one about Nagasaki? Uh no. Yes. Well, I mean, it takes place at the tail end of World War II. It's not that there's the, there's no atomic explosion to my recollection in the film. Okay, do you remember an anime movie? It's famous. I consistently forget the name of it, but I gave it to my eight-year-old nephew. Uh, it's where the two children walk out of Nagasaki. I you think remember I've, that one? I think I've seen that one. I just can't remember the title. Right. Uh, so I sent it to my nephew, Salmon, who designed one of the early uh, designs for uh, the Dork Forest. And he was about eight or nine at the time, and I didn't watch it before I sent it to him, and it was a DVD, because he really liked anime yeah. and this is in 1994 1995 and he goes I, I call him up and i was like hey did you like that that uh cartoon i sent you and he goes yeah it was <laughs> super sad and i was like what he goes you know they survived the 
the bomb. And I was and what it did is it made me watch everything before I provided yeah. it for my nieces and nephews after that. After that. He he, of course, became an old soul in yeah. that moment. Anyway, so it's not that guy. This is so what is um Tale So which one was Kaguya. first? Pompoco? I think Pompoco was first. Fire? So Grave Grave of Fireflies, Pompoco, and then there's later on there's Tale of Princess Kaguya, which is his last one. And he, he has some others as well, which I'm blanking on. But right. Tale of Princess Kaguya has a really interesting art style because it almost looks like it was sketched with pencil but still colored, right? Okay. So I know you know comics, and I don't know if you know like 80s and 90s comics, but Gene Colan, the great ar- artist with like Tomb of Dracula and, and Defenders and stuff like that, he did some pencil art stuff that got colored. So it has a little bit of a look like that. Um, okay. But the story, I believe it's a classic Japanese fairy tale. About a, a a child, you know, virgin birth. So it's a girl. She's born out of, I think, a gold nugget from a tree. I can't remember if that's the detail. Nice. And uh, she grows up super fast, like a lot of characters who are, you know, virgin birth mythic. To an, <laughs> you know, to an elderly couple who wanted a child, couldn't have one, and she is full of whimsy and delight, and she's a delight to everybody around her. But this movie, this story, takes a stunning turn because she, I guess sort of in a like a Jesus way or some other uh, mythic religious <laughs> stories. She, Something that's just like Jesus but doesn't hurt anyone's feelings. Is that okay? Yeah, no. we'll go with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so sent to Earth in order to understand human life. And unfortunately, this is in this Buddhist <laughs> context, learns that, hey, you're not supposed to get attached to people. But instead of it being a pro-non-attachment method uh, message, it's all about how non-attachment is horrible because that means you can't love. Oh, wow. So it, it, it it's a stunner. And once again, the Isao Takata reduces me to tears, sobbing at the end because the movie is that sad and that powerful. Just a super Wow, film. this sounds like I'm not going to watch it <laughs> just because it sounds super sad. But that's interesting to me that um, that it's... Because it it sounds like it's beautiful. The art is beautiful, and w- and it's a it's an ancient, uh, it's it's an ancient parable, but it's a weird parable because it's not pro Buddhist. It's not exactly. And, and there are other religions in Japan like Shintoism, and I guess a lot yeah. of people are atheist, and then they, they try on Christianity for the holidays, you know. So it's good. For, oh, for Christmas. who doesn't love a tree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, especially the Japanese who are like shiny. Please yeah. introduce me. And uh, but the I do love um, that there is this. So I wonder. I do wonder this though. Is if like so? There's this parable that that the 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 tale is that Buddhism create uh, the non attachment means no love. I'm sure like a Buddhist who loves would be like. That's actually not what we're talking about. Is that yes, I believe I, you've I, misunderstood. I, I feel completely confident that there'll be after this podcast, there'll be an angry mob of Buddhists outside of my door saying, We'll show you attachment. <laughs> or just uh I'll just get an email going, um, actually, you uh that isn't true. So and I actually believe that it uh that it isn't true because I think uh, and here's what I know about attachment, by the way, and Buddhism, uh, something I've read in a mystery novel. Yeah. So it's it's essentially like learning about stand-up through an episode of Law & Order, you guys. It isn't great. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, without any information, let's this this is how this uh, this, is how this podcast goes viral. <laughs> uh, so the uh, the but the the idea is that, of course, of course, uh, Buddhism is about non-attachment, but not like that. It means don't be attached to material goods. Don't be attached to s- success as defined by, you know, Time Magazine, whatever. Well, you know, uh, speaking as somebody with decades of non-experience in Buddhism. Uh, <laughs> Finally. Yeah, I would say, you know, that makes, I definitely get the point about don't be attached to material things. But, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, one of those core wisdom principles of, uh, you know, it is desire. It's desiring things uh, that can't be fulfilled, that that's what leads to suffering. So I think, and the, and certainly in the story, I mean, you know, this is, it's not my movie. You know, uh, this is right. Takada's work. Uh, what we see at the end is, as, as Kaguya is, is recalled basically 
from the world of mortals to heaven is that you see a parade of gods who, you know, they have happy, cheerful music, but they're like stone idols. So there's no there's no joy or love in that world. So to me, I take it to be the story is love is going to guarantee that you're going to get hurt. But that doesn't oh. mean you shouldn't love. You know, that that's the uh-huh. whole point of life is to love. And yeah. and Takahata, he, you know, he's interested because in in Grave of the Fireflies, which takes place at the end of World War II, and two Japanese orphans are trying to survive this terrible terrible crisis of of life in Japan. You you don't want to watch it. <laughs> no. This is that's the one I sent to Sam. Okay. Well, it it is Grave okay. of the Fireflies. It is it's, it is it's, beautiful. It's beautiful and devastating. And I and I watched it the first time after yes. my my first child was born, so it was even oh more devastating. Oh my gosh! Aww. Um, but <laughs> but you know that apparently uh, Takahata wanted the story at an early point in the film. The two kids could stay with their aunt. Their aunt's not very nice. Their aunt favors her own child, so it gives them only a little bit of food. And everybody who watched it, including Japan, said like, "Oh, it's so horrible that um, that aunt mistreated them." And that's why these kids, you know, experience utter tragedy. And Takahata's response was, oh, well, see, from my standpoint, I was saying you should stay with a bad aunt because at least you'll live. <laughs> so I thought, huh, right. OK, well, you're the only one who took it that way, apparently. But, uh, you know. Right. And uh, these kids, if I remember, the, if I remember the tiny amount of that that movie that I watched were about. I don't know, between five and nine. Yeah. Right? Yes. Which is when we make our best decisions. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you've ever walked on the opposite side of a bridge. You know, like there's the railing. Yeah. And then you crawl on the other side and walk on the on, on the side that's close to where you would fall to your death. Yeah. That's what I did when I was four and five. Yeah. So uh, I don't think I would have stayed. I would not have stayed with the ant. Well, you know, it's, unfortunately, a lot of us, you know, we just put up with stuff. You know, I mean, a lot of people do put up with, well, and I, I mean, of course, I'm very familiar with your life story that you very generously share through all of your comedy and podcasts. Oh so God. it sounds like you put up with a lot, too. So, you know, people do put up with bad stuff and, and survive. Others right, don't. Right, because you also think that it's not anything that, that everyone lives like this. Like, it's not going to get better if you go live in foster care, which right. it might, you know. Yes. I mean, some people who do... Who, who to take care of it's just unfortunately the pe- the people who are foster parents are often not psychologists and fabulously wealthy well i will say so you know very, reading yeah. foster care survivor stories monthly it's just one heroic tale after another people are so glad they went to foster care i mean oh, the joy in the the this being able to depend on beatings and starvation and favoritism right and <laughs> favoritism <laughs> oh my gosh and of course and i know this again mystery it's another mystery novel you guys i've been reading mystery novels almost nonstop for about uh ever since it would be what 2018 anyway for the last five years a lot of mystery novels uh the previous five years a lot of romance novels previous five years a lot of science fiction novels and i'm still peppering in romance novels and science fiction novels don't get me wrong but uh foster care i'm watching an episode of bones (laughs) which is a very light uh, TV mystery show that somebody's aunt is no doubt watching right now. And um, foster kids don't have any luggage. Right. They just have uh, these hefty bags. You just take your stuff in a hefty bag. And so there is actually um, a very nice charity that gives uh, luggage to foster kids. And they're just like, get them, get them a mediocre roller board. You don't have to buy them thousand dollar luggage, but everyone should have like a regular rolling piece of luggage where they can at least put their teddy bear in their fucking clothes. <laughs> anyway, it's, a, um, you know, it's a both, it's a beautiful gift and a really sad, ironic gift. Cause it's the gift that says, I expect to be uprooted again shortly. I'm just going right. to leave this packed right underneath my bed. I could be running at any time. Oh, oh my gosh. Wow, it's almost like you were in foster. I was not in foster no. care. I'm surprised I wasn't, quite honestly, from from the neglect that was happening <laughs> as a tiny child. Yeah. But uh, you know that the principal of my grade of one of my grade schools, because we went to all, I went to almost all the grade schools in my small factory town. But uh, the principal of one of them wanted to adopt one of my brothers. <laughs> Just one, just my brother Russ. Check out his his Hallmark Christmas special episode of the Dark Forest, you guys. Uh, Russ 
is so he always could see he was always considered like the super lucky he he didn't go he was like no because he liked my grandmother i think uh but um he was he always considered himself having a lucky upbringing in his early 60s now he's sort of coming to the conclusion that his childhood wasn't idyllic and that's so funny because the rest of us did it when we were 30 where you processed it and went, well, they did the best they could. I guess I shouldn't either kill myself or them. And then you keep going. I mean, you know, yeah, it's weird. It, it has some very nasty side effects, but one of the sweetest drinks in the world is denial. <laughs> it gets you through oh, some yes. pretty bad stuff. And so, you know, but, you know, you wake up with two, your kidneys missing and maybe one of your legs <laughs> broken, but hey. Just one kidney. They're not going to take both. That, that's greedy. That would That's be just greedy. rude at that That's... point. You got to leave them <laughs> at least one kid. You mentioned mystery novels. I have to say, you got to check out the mystery novels of Wayne Arthurson. He's one of oh. Canada's top uh, writers, and he's certainly one of the best uh, mystery novelists. And he's got a core series about a reporter named Leo DeRoche, who's a Métis reporter, and he works at the big paper in Edmonton, which is which is where I live. And it's about him encountering these. Uh, stories that Minister Faust is Canadian. Yeah, you're in Canada. I sure am. You guys, the Dork Forest International again. <laughs> anyway, uh, awesome. Yeah. I am reading a Canadian mystery writer right now. Who? Uh, her name is Louise Penny. Oh yeah, from Quebec. From Quebec, and she writes about uh, like a, a French uh, one of the he's a an inspector and he goes to this tiny town called Three Pines outside of Montreal to solve most of his murders and Three Pines is a brigadoon like uh, adorable adorable idyllic uh tiny small town that is couldn't be couldn't be more uh what everyone hopes a town would be you know like that the there's a a married gay couple that owns the cafe uh, there is a woman who's fled Quebec uh, just to, uh, so that she can start a bookstore. And, uh, and then there's artists and there's people of color. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a glorious place that, um, eh, it's all right. But uh, sh yeah, she's really good. So I'm Wayne Arthurson. Yeah. Is it S-O-N or S-E-N? S-O-N. And okay. uh, these, the, his, his series is great because the stories are, uh, connected with their indigenous related stories. So oh, that's neat. And, and from everything from like major Canadian issues, such as the mining in extra, like in the far North, uh, that are, are directly affecting like the Dene nation and Inuit, as well as native gangs. And then there's like labor stuff. And, and also this awful thing that I'd never heard of until I, like I have, I'm a writer. So I have lots of writer friends, including lots of indigenous writer friends. And they introduced me to this term starlight tours. I don't know if you if you know that expression. No. It is one of those classic expressions that sounds happy and is utterly evil. So cops, colonials, you know, would pick up indigenous people, drive them to the edge of town at night, often in winter, and maybe without their shoes, and leave them there. And somebody named this Starlight Tours? Starlight Tours. This is in also, so Canada, I know in the U.S. you have this idea often that Canadians are so polite. They're just so nice. It's like, it's an act. It is an evil, yeah. sick act. Okay. Right, right, right. That, that's just the first layer. Yeah. Yeah. You put, and it's pretty paper thin. You punch through and it turns out humans. Yes, exactly. Uh, full of assholes. Yes. In fact, and every time I, I say to people like, look, I say to fellow Canadians, like, think of every person you've ever met who bullied you. Who ripped you off? Who broke your heart? Who stole from you? <laughs> Canadians. Every last one of them. But anyway, so <laughs> there's another term we have in Canada, which is, again, sounds wonderful. It's called the 60s scoop. Sounds like a, a dance or maybe like a great, you know, novelty dessert. The 60s scoop was a go settler government mass kidnapping program to seize indigenous children from their families. Wow. That's what we call it. It's almost like Mad Men came up with the ad campaign names <laughs> to, hey, we're going to kill some indigenous people and we're going to steal their children yeah. and try to assimilate them. It's that thing that they did in um, Australia 
uh, as well in the 50s and 60s. I believe the United States, we got in on the ground floor of that back in the late 1800s, where they were like, no, everybody has to go to, everybody has to learn English and they have to go to school and they have to, um, I don't think we named it anything nice though. There, I think we were just like, I think Americans mm, have, you're going to uh, want, you this. guys have other awesome, uh, you know, uh, euphemisms. Like for instance, instead of saying continent wide rape gulag, you say the South. Oh, <laughs> Now, uh, this uh, the South is troubled. Yes, it is. Uh, but don't kid yourself. The North, uh, there's nothing to write home about. Uh, we call it the prison system, but it's actually just legalized slavery. Yeah. It's more slavery is what we're calling it. And, uh, yeah, there's trouble. Have you heard my joke about murder hornets? No, go ahead, please. Oh, that's because uh, murder hornets are real. They're wasps, right? right? that we had an infestation here in Los Angeles about two or three years ago. They came, they were killing, and they're good. They're in the ecosystem. They have a purpose and a point. They kill smaller um, insects that are invasive. And But the weird thing about the term murder hornets is that's what I've been calling the cops. <laughs> and uh, I would posit, and I have posited on my my, my previous album, Hero, uh, that that that... Uh, murder hornets cops are also part of the ecosystem and have some uses like sometimes there's criminals right that have bang bangs you send murder hornets to those to those crimes you don't need a murder hornet for every crime it turns out you got loud neighbors how about different animals how about you why don't you send a social worker bee yeah why don't you send some crickets to tell them to zip it why don't you you know we got a homeless problem how about one million carpenter ants? Stat. Love it. Anyway, there's a bunch of other uh, insects that are referenced in that joke. See my published works. I, now, I love an extended metaphor. <laughs> and that's exactly what that is. It just keeps going. I was like, too many. I had to cut some out is what, no, <laughs> is what happened. No, you didn't. No, it needs more. There must be. That's a whole <laughs> album. And ultimately, you get to have a, a theme park out of this. Right. Oh, with the or a virtual reality a, tour. <laughs> right. Right. Put on a helmet. VR tour. Different. It, it could be a great video game, actually, where you get to choose the kind of cop that you are. You want to be a murder hornet. You got some Vice City happening. Social worker be. It's a more of a Sims kind of situation. Anyway, uh, yeah, on this, I'll, you know, the insanity that we live in currently. You got to think how many times have you heard, you know. Uh, a medic, uh, an EMT, whatever, shows up out of the ambulance. Person's had a heart attack, mental breakdown, and kills them. It's, that just doesn't happen. In fact, I think there would be probably some discipline. You know, it's just conceivable. But right. how often do police show up for wellness checks and kill people? You right. Kind of right. Think it's hard. It's hard. Some people won't even dial nine one one just because they're it's going to kill. Them. Oh, hey, I mean, I would so, be scared. I mean, for me, as a Kenyan Canadian, as an African right. in North America, I would be very scared to call the police over any number of things. I might call the police on behalf of somebody else, but I'd be worried about my own situation. And I've dealt with some of these situations where they, they show up and treat me like I'm the enemy. And we just had a case in Edmonton just recently where. You know, a couple of guys, and I, I think they might have been Ethiopian Canadians, they, they stopped somebody who was trying to rob them. Police showed up, pepper sprayed them, and beat them. Ah, uh, that isn't actually uh, a, a, a strong enough response. Uh, but uh, except for the fact that it happened so often that you're just like, I don't know. And it's, but I have heard that they are, they are delegating some of this stuff to other departments and creating sort of wellness check departments. So they are creating social worker bees. Uh, what I like about stand-up comedy is that you write a joke and then all of a sudden it becomes true. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there are Native American restaurants. I did a joke about um, how Andy was sad that there were no Native American restaurants at the uh, Indian casino, which is what they are called. I didn't name them Indian casinos. Thank you very much. Uh, they look like the Bellagio. It's all working out. Uh, so, but the, um, but they're, but they don't, there aren't Native American, but they're like high end, you know, it's $26 a plate for fry bread that they turned into a taco. And you're like, yes, please. I love fry bread. That's called reparations so, bread. 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, I would also like a mule. <laughs> so yeah, they're not wrong. It's uh, so, but it's so grave of the fireflies. <laughs> so these, yeah, but let's that get was back a segue to, the, for the ages. That was nice. It is. Thank you very much. I'm here all week. So uh, Takanada, right? Uh, Takahata. Sort of. Ta- okay, Takahata. Not Torquemada, oh, but Takahata. Not Torquemada? Yeah. Who's Torquemada? That's, wasn't he the Spanish Inquisitor? And the, in, in, in oh. uh, Mel Brooks' um, uh, History of the World Part 1, he even gets referenced in the Spanish Inquisition song. Oh, well, it's uh, somebody, somebody did a little research, which I love that about them. Uh, I, all I have is Cortez oh. in my in in the chamber for some yeah. reason. The rest of it, there was, I'm sure there was a bunch of lower level goons that uh, that didn't didn't get the the press they deserved. Now, <clears throat> here's my question yes. though: Is it is he doing the art? Is he is he also art directing? Is it great his? question? Now I I know less about even though I'm a lifelong comics and animation fan, I know less about what a director does in animation. So. I think they this person probably does the key character designs and then okay. uh and, and then probably has the art style that sets the look for the whole film. And if you look at something by Miyazaki like um uh the uh the Nausicaa and the Valley of the Winds, uh that was a Miyazaki um uh a manga first, right? So then that really oh. dictates the whole look and the story. So I think in this particular case, he's probably not drawing, you know, Eight trillion uh, no, no. acetates, but, but he's like art directing <laughs> yeah. it, and and he's controlling uh, the and look. he is, and he is also an artist. Yes, if he did the absolutely, and and Nausicaa, by the way, my favorite Miyazaki. It's a wonderful, and I ha- and I hate bugs, <laughs> and by the end of it, I was like, no, no, I love bugs. Yeah, and that's uh, a great film. So- Edward James Olmos is in that, and I I mentioned that because as as much as I, I'm not one of these people who's against dubbing. Like I, when I'm tired, I can't read subtitles. I'm just too tired, right? So I just want to watch, okay. right? Although I, I'm, right. I love subtitles when I'm awake. But with animation, yeah, <laughs> when animation is beautiful, right? So you really don't want to be missing it by looking down. But you know that's okay. Anyway, the thing about these Studio Ghibli movies that I think Disney slash Pixar was in charge of having uh, b- distributing in North America is that when it came to casting voice actors for the dub versions, it's pretty much you got to be white or you're out and edward, edward right. james almost is the only actor that comes to mind as one who actually got to do one of these voices and i think well, how how on earth can that be you're all playing japanese characters so what right. what is the big Tina deal Fey playing ponyo ponyo's mom yeah not ideal no <laughs> not no I- even uh, worse in, when they're, that, they're in trying- that soul movie where you know she actually is the ghost who takes oh. over the body of an african man so there's a that's right. a whole thing in movies of like the control of an African body, especially in the movie Get Out, right? So it's like, yeah, at first I was like, I like this film. And then f- my friends kept on saying, yeah, but what about this? And I went, oh, yeah, that's true. Right, right, right. And you're like, still very beautiful, but troubled. Yes. It's like trying to watch any, you know, I'm, you know, I'm busy trying to enjoy a Spencer Tracy movie. Uh, and yet... He was a shit bag. Yeah. And uh, and that shows you how old I am. I'm referencing a Spencer Tracy novel, uh, but movie. <clears throat> so we have rights as I Generation do, X. We have rights to refer to all of the things we grew up with. Right. Which everybody and, and there's there's definitely decades of stuff that I missed. Right. Because uh, like uh, I took an improv class with um, a bunch of 20 year olds and there was some musical thing. And first of all, Music is hard. Uh, I like music. I'm not. I'm not a monster. <laughs> I just don't know who's singing, yes. and I don't. Uh, and I haven't heard a lot of the new stuff. And, but I, I, as I've been told, you've heard her, Jackie. You've been to the grocery store, and I'm like, oh, that's right. She's enormously famous. Whoever, right? It could be anybody, right? Whether it's Miley Cyrus or Beyonce, or it doesn't <laughs> can't possibly matter. Okay, but so wherever, like, you can be um, colorblind. So why can't you be pop blind? Like there's all kinds of artists playing on the radio. I'm not going to remember them. They all sound alike to me and I'm not yucking anybody's yum. I'm just saying it doesn't make, it doesn't get in, in here. But I got to ask you about oh, music it, use in one of your outstanding, one of your many outstanding albums. You have this whole bit on hip hop and you even reference specifically reference BDP. 
And I was curious to know, oh, right. one of my all-time favorite bands, headed by the great Karis one was that just yeah. research, or were you really listening to everybody you just referenced? I researched nothing. Uh, I, that is, uh, I, and, but here's the thing. I got into KRS-One because of Jimmy Hat, <laughs> which is a dick joke, essentially. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's essentially wear a condom, <laughs> yeah. 1989, yeah. 88, 88, right? And, and uh, what it did was it made me buy that yeah. album, which made me really like yeah. him, which really made me really like Scott LaRock. Which made me buy the next album, which made me buy Big Daddy Kane, which made me buy Eric B and Rakim. All that you reference in the same me, in the same bit. Yeah, who? Yeah, yeah whoever he talked yeah. about, I bought their album and for the most part really enjoyed it. And then like nine years go by, and I'm like, I would like to listen to a common album. <laughs> and then I bought a, you know, the thing is, is what happens is, is I, and I will say this, pop pop songs right now have some of the funniest lyrics I've ever... There was... Um, intentionally funny. Intentionally. Jan- Janelle Monet. Mm. Okay. Great artist. She has a line where she is very angry. Yeah. And she says, get off my areola. Well, that is hilarious. <laughs> and uh, you're, I, she wins. Yes. She yes. wins <laughs> making me laugh out loud to a, to a nice beat. And the kids can dance yeah. to it. So... Um, and there's a there's a um there's a country music singer that somebody turned me on to named this can't actually be her real name like she probably showed up and her name was like Elizabeth Warren <laughs> no. but uh her it her, it's Ashley McBride yeah. doesn't that sound like a country music song yes a, a right sure. singer so she's not famous there are other McBrides there are other Ashleys they're famous in the country music scene Ashley McBride has a very popular album right now. But uh, one of the, she has a, a song, Leave the Kitchen Light On. Yeah. It's an adorable country music song about, you know, getting a place to bitch. <laughs> That's what you do. You leave the kitchen light on. And then, uh, then there was another one. Uh, it was about doing, uh, singing on the road and being on the road. And it was, there was a line in it that was, you, you might think it's <clears throat> cocaine and champagne, but it's actually Adderall and alcohol. <laughs> And, <laughs> and that made me okay. laugh. And I was like, you win. So I will say that with, I tend to like lyrics, which is why I like hip hop and why I like country yeah. music. Cause they're both storytelling yes, for sure. But that weird song with, um, Rihanna and the late Kanye West. <laughs> and, uh, I think Paul McCartney, five seconds, four or five yeah. seconds. And it's about how angry, it's just it's it's about I have about four or five seconds until I punch you in yeah. the nose is what the song is yeah. about right, and but it's got a good beat and I enjoy it and it makes me laugh every time they say it. They're like it's three days to Friday. I got to make it to Monday. I'm about four seconds from uh, essentially punching you right in the face. So you should probably get away from well, me. Well, I I, I don't know much laugh. about those three people. Rihanna seems pretty impressive. She created a great makeup line that is useful for like mil- millions of, of African women in particular. Uh, and she made billions. So I'm all in favor of that. Uh, I don't, I'm not a Beatles guy, but a, he's dude's a vegetarian. Okay. I understand he's supposed to be a humanitarian. I don't know. Could be Kanye West. A song about, <laughs> about uh, by him in which he's he's talking we're, about being four seconds away. <laughs> I think like we are way past the four seconds. You know, he just full right, on embraced right. fascism. Luckily, luckily we're uh he's dead. And uh and we can just admire his work in in posthumously. He's uh sadly not dead. He's living in Calabasas, going to the Rolex store. I just anyway, I don't so, wish him death. I just wish him I wish him two things mental health and intense crippling regret. <laughs> See, there's that song too. It's a uh, Keisha, I think, has a song about I'm gonna pray you away from me or something. It was like I I wish you a great deal of remorse. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and I think Bruno Mars has a song. Look at me referencing artists. Very impressive. Uh, very nice. He's uh, he's like uh, smoking out the window. It's where he's singing the song about how is that Bruno Mars? Maybe not. But whatever it is. Uh, his girlfriend has taken advantage of him and um and he's like i just uh he's like i don't wish you anything bad except for i your trifling ass uh to be unhappy 
at this point, at least somewhat unhappy. And um, it's, you know, we're all supposed to be so forgiving <laughs> and so mature. Yeah. And we're working on it, you know, the best of us, you know, and even the, the, the middle I'm of scheduled us. to work on uh, it. Yes, yeah, scheduled. You? I mean, I'll get to it. Put it on your, put it on your, you make it a recurring. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, you Google, Google calendars will let you do that every, every month. Check in. How am I doing? And, uh, but yeah, but it's also important, I think, to find some joy in not Freud and Shot or Shot and Freud. And Freud or whatever. The, yeah. But I uh, like Freud and Shot. That sounds like, yeah, that Freud sounds like a hip hop duo from Austria. <laughs> You know, it also sounds like uh, you have some trouble with your mom and uh, if you're Freud and shot. And uh, so the but the yeah, I will say it's multilingual jokes. These This is nice. This is some real gold here, <laughs> Rangers. Hey, let's let's pretend that there might be an ad nice. here and I'll write down the time code. And now we're back. Was there I'll an ad? It. If there I'll wasn't, it. that was a great product right. and or service. <laughs> exactly did i recommend that you purchase something if it sounded like it was for you get in on it here you go so <clears throat> now we have talked about we so i like the idea of pompoco being about raccoons yes, which they call raccoon dogs which is a funny japanese it's an english version of the japanese word raccoon dogs and the prin- the princess Tale of Princess Kago, yeah. Uh, w- right. That's that's the Buddhism yeah. one. The Grave of the Fireflies is uh, about these two children who set out. Orphans uh, trying to, to survive the end of World War II in Japan. Spoiler alert, probably not. Because this guy's willing to tell a real story is what you're yeah, telling Yeah, as the, as the kids will say, he'll go there. He'll yeah. go there. Yeah, I mean, I, he really, I mean, I think he... And he's using animation, which is what sucked me into sending that to my eight-year-old nephew. <laughs> we live in this weird bubble in North America where so many people, even in our generation, grew up with the notion that animation, like comics, is just for little kids. And other parts of the world right. just accept animation is just a format for telling stories. And so, you know, it's weird, uh, you know, ha- how many people will just refuse to watch something that's animated. Now, that's changed a lot in the last 20 years because of Pixar. Yeah. But still, I mean, some of the best in Japan movies that you would just think, a North American would say, I don't get it. Why is this animated? They would just say, like, why wouldn't right. it be animated? They'll just tell any story that, that way. That is an excellent, excellent point because that is so good because that's so true. There is a Christmas, there's a Japanese Christmas story that is Tokyo Godfathers. That's it. Great film. It is super fun and beautiful. Yeah, showed it to my family last Christmas. Everybody loved it. And and it's also like way ahead of its time because it's about a, one of the three or four main characters is a transgender character. Right. When 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 no one was admitting that that was yeah. a thing. Uh, do you know that I uh, one of the probably one of the last five or six uh, romance novels I picked up at the CVS. That's right. While traveling was a historical romance novel set in the time of Wellington and and that war 1815 uh, and uh and Napoleon and uh the main character was transgender interesting and it was very well Ooh. done in the way of a romance novel and not my porn <laughs> not for me uh because i read romance novels i want sexy times <laughs> in my romance novels and uh but it was actually really co- i read it and i was like well that was actually really cool and awesome for um and and to have it just sort of out in cvs where all of a sudden you're reading it and you're like wait this woman was assigned a ma- <laughs> was, was male at birth and uh I was like, all right, am I going to keep reading it? Are they going to make out? And uh, they didn't make yeah. out enough for me. I, it's sort of like Will and Grace where they, uh, they're they just introducing it right. to us. And so they don't want to scare anyone away, the straight, the straighty yeah. magoos. They're like, it's okay. They're just people. We're going to show you their emotional life. And I'm like, that's not why I picked up a romance novel. I didn't want to see somebody's emotional life. I got to uh, say, you, you got to do, like, as a series, like as an arc in the podcast, 
you got to do not my porn where people come on and they try to because oh. you just said that people come on and they try to they're really excited and they're very you know they're very excited. Uh, and aroused <laughs> about whatever it is that's getting them. And then you just at the end, you listen to them and you're always thoughtful and kind. And then you just say, yeah, but not my porn. Not my porn. It's yes. Well, God love them. <laughs> this is, this is my t-shirt, which is by the way, our oh, I just saw love. that for the first time. That's beautiful. Yeah, It's a little star Wars. Uh, it's Luke making a heart as he, uh, kneecaps the ad ads. Anyway, so, uh, but okay, so let's go because we are, we only have 15 minutes left because I have hijacked much of your episode. Uh, ministerfaust.com, yes. by you. the way, uh, is where everyone should go to buy his books, to check it out. And he's uh, teaching a creative writing yes. course uh, at UMFers. Those of you looking for a master's in fine arts uh, might want to uh, hook yourself up. And take a, is it online? It will be. It's going to be an online class called Write Like MF. And there's a course on plotting, plot like MF. There's uh, characterization okay. like an MF, et cetera. That's, you can see the theme developing. It's been branded. It, I have branded, branded it, branded absolutely. <laughs> yes. And there's world building and stuff. And I'm curious because you have remarked a couple of times in your podcast, even going way back, that you wanted to write a novel. Right. And I've also said I wanted to have written. <laughs> yes. Uh, so because it turns out it's a great deal of work. Uh, I could take the class. I could take the class. Well, I'm just curious. But so, right. I, I mean, I wasn't trying to I wasn't I was not manipulate maneuvering you into <laughs> oh. taking. the. I mean, of course, <laughs> no time but the pressure to, to pitch that. This is a fine. But, but what would you write about? Because you've got all these interests. You are such a reader and you love like so many of the same things that I love. Plus, you've got this comic angle. And it, because you love detective or mystery fiction. The best thing about mystery fiction is that everybody gets to be a protagonist. You could be a cheesemaker from Zimbabwe who's also a uh, a teacher of, you know, uh, Renaissance philosophy, and there would be a mystery novel for you. So what's your ideal book yes. to write? Let me tell you, you, what you've done is you've created rage here in the dark forest, Minister Faust, because uh, I once picked up a book because uh, it was written by a woman from northern Minnesota, and her name is Joanna Fluke. And I really hope that she made that name up. And I have to tell you this, it's a fluke that she was published. Because, but there's so many of them. And they're they're essentially cozy mysteries. Mm, have you? That's a genre I don't know. You know the genre? It's a genre that should be knifed in its sleep. That's not true. You guys, if you like a cozy mystery, Jackie at Jackie Cation me, we'll do a dork forest, we'll celebrate how you love it. But Joanna Fluke will do like a muffin recipe at the end of every chapter. And the one that I read, it was called the Blueberry Muffin Murder Mystery, I believe. And uh, she is a the, the main character is a baker. Mm. Lives in northern, like the Iron Range or something up in northern Minnesota. And she is uh, not a detective and she doesn't solve the crime. She's just baking. And then things happen around her and people come in and talk to her about the 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 story as far as i remember i was so enraged <laughs> and i don't even know why i finished it i was like how is this gonna end is what it is what it made me do and i'm actually a very good skimmer mm. yeah. of books i will yeah 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 no no that's fine that's fine that's fine um that's what every what author wants to hear are... that's like finding exactly, out that your, your right? lover was <laughs> thinking of kojak uh and the groceries during your intimate moments <laughs> you are correct uh, i will say that um but my one of my favorite series uh a couple of them but the favorite funny one that i would have liked yeah. to have written and i've never said this at stand-up there's no comic that i wish i was mm. there's no comic where i was like i wish i'd written that right. joke there's a couple of jokes where i'm like that's a great joke. Uh, I, I, that's not specifically true. There's one joke, but the uh, the Richard, I forgot his last name, Osman, maybe, uh, and he wrote the Thursday Murder Club books. Did you read no. that? The British. Uh, they're set. First of all, he said that he he because I've read interviews with him, and he said that he wrote the book because he went to a, a senior retirement home and they had a restaurant. And it was 1130 in the afternoon, in the morning, and everybody was drinking. And there were all these old people that were clearly 
incredibly, like they had had amazing jobs, like MI5 and nurses and union agitators and psychologists and Ooh. all these things. So he took four of these elderly people and turned, and and every every day at, at the, uh, whatever the name of the retirement facility is in Kent, uh, they they have like a puzzle room, right? And so like there's a French conversation club, there's a, uh, and they have a Thursday murder mm. club where they, where they have stacks of cold cases that one of their members used to be a cop and stole them when she retired. Uh, just all cold cases and they go well, she, through them. She, she, she trumps and the then, files. Right, right. And, but I believe kept them in a waterproof. Lisa, uh, Lisa's so, that. And, and wanted to use their powers yes. for good. And so, not selling uh, them to international yeah. bad actors. Gotcha. Yeah. Right, right. Didn't decide to become yeah. a traitor and, and, a, and a shitwit. But uh, the, uh, so, but the thing is, is he's a, uh, He's a comic and a game show host, Richard Osman, I think his name is, in England. And he is also this, and Steven Spielberg option. Really? Helen Mirren supposedly is going to be in it. Yeah. And so, but what I like about him is that they're real slice of life. You might want to read it or just because they're incredibly easy to read. The chapters are maybe two pages. There's that is a good thing. Them. I do not understand the fixation on people treating, uh, you know, reading like self-flagellation. I read all th- 15,000 pages of this Russian epic. It's like, dude, this was supposed to be fun. You know, it was supposed to be a good right. time. And maybe it was when he wrote <laughs> it because everyone was a lot more interested. Like Life less, was slower. There was... And more it miserable was... <laughs> and more oppressive. So, you know, that's okay. You, you had to curl right. in for the eight-month winter. So in Siberia, right. so, you know, you took your time. I tried to read Moby Dick the, uh, like a couple of years ago and I got to like page a hundred and I was like, it's funny. It's interesting. We're still not on this fucking boat. I can't care. And I had, I put it down and I was like, I'm just going to read something else for a second. And then I didn't pick it up again. Same with Don Quixote. I was, I started Don Quixote and I got maybe, a, maybe 75, a hundred pages in. And I was like, no, it's interesting. It's sweet. It's interest. I can't. I just got to read something easier to read I, right now, which maybe I don't want reading to be like guys at the dude steroid dudes at the gym who were bragging about how much they lifted. So like I want to yeah. get better and healthier and enjoy life. I do not want to treat my reading like it's some horrible. If there's no pain, there's no gain. Let me enjoy the story, now, please. I, yes. Now. That is a perfect segue in our last 10 minutes for me to be able to ask you about a show that I've tried to watch three different times, which is Attack on Titan. But you hate horror. I don't like horror, but everyone keeps telling me how great it is, and I can see that it's great. But I'm scared when the giant people eat the tiny people. And I'm like... And the kids, you know, and and I know that a lot. Of, like, I have a friend who's in Naruto. She is Naruto, and uh, she does. The oh, voice that's a of very Naruto. different concept. Um, okay, she does the voice. It's a very okay. different. Okay, I thought concept. you meant she is right. Naruto, and I thought. Oh right, she there's lives a whole that different life. thing going on. She here. is. It's all about yeah. friendship, you guys. Anyway, so Attack on Titan. I was like, well, maybe it'll be all about friendship. When they go to fight these giant yeah, people. Look, I mean, on that level, one of the reasons that show is so brilliant is because it is more psychologically rich and complex than almost any live action series I've ever seen. And its level of historical commentary, which it doesn't really crystallize until the fourth season. But when it does, you you say like, oh, my gosh, this fourth season requires me to re-examine everything that I just saw, because not only is the story that intricate, but the historical psychological exploration of humanity and warfare and racism and self-hatred is that deep. I mean, it is when I first saw it, I thought, yeah, this looks awful. I mean, it's like big corpse people, monsters. This looks stupid. And my elder child was saying, dad, you have to watch this show. And I started watching. I was like, "Eh," I was kind of paying like 10% attention and falling asleep because that's what you do when you're a dad and you've had a long day. And then I, the story took a turn and I thought, what the, and then I was hooked and the show just got better and better and better. And really, if, if, you know, if you ever watched the, the great Ron Moore reboot of Battlestar Galactica, you'd see aspects of that in this show. 
Uh, it's it it is it's brilliant, and uh, there's no dub version to, except maybe the first season. So you know you're listening to these wonderful Japanese voice actors, and you know Japan has lots of regional accents, of course. So then you're getting this sense of like, oh, so this is like a rustic bum, and this is a criminal voice, and all that stuff. But it's just the intensity of looking at the evil of oppressive societies and how people justify harming other people. It's it is. There's nothing like it. So, but you know, if you don't. And how old was your elder child when they so started? So I'm a bad watching? parent, and uh, so our, our, our <laughs> both of our kids were watching stuff that they probably shouldn't have. Especially, you know, younger kids. You're a youngest child, right? So I don't right. know. How, yeah, like, oh, yeah. and I am, and I am too. And so you, you, by that point, parents are kind of like, ah, it'll work out. And so you, you watch stuff that's going to scar you for life. <laughs> right now, my younger child will just tell me day after day when we're watching something again. We haven't seen it in five, ten years. She said, when, oh, yeah, this used to terrify me when I was little. <laughs> you wanted to watch this. Why didn't you say something? <laughs> yeah. So that's. Yeah, well, we were together. We were sitting together we, watching. We were it. scarred it was fun. together. So we'll stay together. Yes. Yes. So, but like, it's, I think about that with Salmon and the grave, uh, the fireflies. Um so, but I will say that, um, th- how many seasons are there? Of what a, that there? you see, that question is more, is, is it still yes, ongoing? That question is funnier than you planned it to be because so there were three seasons. Then there was a fourth season called the season was called the final season. So you're watching it and then it takes a season break so that they can come back for season four, part two of the five. So wait a second, this is season five, guys. You can't lie to me. No, no, it's still the season four. Then it takes another break, and it comes back for three episodes, which are bundled together as a movie, and they're still not done. So, you know, really, it's like season eight is coming out, but it's technically it's four seasons. So did you, uh, it's got to also be manga. It's it was manga first. Manga yeah, that's as well, right. right? Okay. And is that still no, ongoing to your knowledge? No, that's done, or? and I have avoided reading it because I didn't want to give away the 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 end. And I'm told that there may be right. some differences in how they'll play out. But uh, I mean, it's it's superb. Okay, that's I just bought some new manga called uh, Tokyo oh. Ghoul, which is also a TV show. And I gave it to my friend Lori Kilmartin's son, who I do a podcast called The Jackie yeah. Morris Show. Uh, this young man does not enjoy mm-hmm. reading. He's right. never enjoyed reading. He's yeah. now 16. He is an art he's yeah. art boy yeah. is what he is. He likes to draw. He enjoys like monumentally. So about 4 or 5 years ago, I was like, what do you mean he doesn't read? But he likes to draw. Allow me to introduce him yeah. to this manga, which my nephew was really into cuz he is of that generation who grew yes. up reading manga, yeah. watching anime. And so I gave him so he really got, he started getting into manga and more and more into anime. And so I, I bought Tokyo Ghoul for him. And it's essentially, um, it's about a, a in Tokyo, uh, there is a department that deals with ghouls. And uh, it's, you know, it's NCIS, yeah. but ghouls, as far as I can tell. Supernatural detective and, but stuff. Probably, lots of, lots of, it's, a, it's a genre yes. unto itself. Right. So he was... Uh, uh, he's 16 now. He's, he was like, oh, the show was terrible, but I heard the manga was good, so thank you. And the thing with manga, you get him the first one. It's I don't know if you ever watched but, uh, this uh, Welcome Back Connor reference. The first potato kanesh <laughs> is free. And uh, so then he's got to get his own Very potato nice. kanesh. So, uh, okay, so Attack on Titan. So there's three solid seasons with, with yes, episodes. And, the, and each episode uh, is an hour? All 20 minutes. Or so, you know, you could rip through it quickly, oh. but like, seriously, I would say this is a show that is worth savoring. It's one of those shows where if you, if you, if you just, you know, chugged it, you know, you would enjoy it, but then it would leave your system violently and, you know, it wouldn't stay with you. Right. So <laughs> why not just savor it and love it? What about the, what about a rewatch? Is it a oh, good 100%. rewatch? Oh, 100%. Like I, 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 like, so when I was okay. a kid, I don't know if you did this because of course we didn't have DVDs and libraries with VHS cassettes and all that. Just, we didn't have VCRs, right? So you could see a show once in the theaters and then if you were really lucky or spoiled or whatever, you could see it many times. Somebody died. You died. Then they'd show it on TV and you're like, wait, Jimmy Stewart died? Oh my God. That means. Exactly. So 
That means we're going to get exactly. to see his movies. And, you know, and like when we were kids, like Star Wars was like on TV. I don't know how long it took to come on television, right? Yeah. So, so long. That being said, like I saw it a lot of times in the theater, a disgustingly high number yeah, of times too. that I, I yeah, don't want to reveal. ridiculous exactly. number of times. But, so we yeah. grew up. I was yeah, proud oh, of I used the to time. brag about it. It's like, why are you bragging about this? Who was going to be impressed? Other people as deranged as I was would be impressed by this. Uh, Minister Faust, by the way, married with children. That's right. Yes. It could happen to you. You could be a nerd. I'm happy all to say out. that it can work out. Yeah. It's just make sure you get those breath mints and deodorant is your friend. Uh, I was as an author. I gotta say this. I was working with my first couple of books came out from Del Rey, which was part of Random House, and I was working with a terrific uh, publicist. And you know, she was. I had lots of media experience. I'd been radio broadcaster, all that kind of stuff. But she said to me, like, you know, you're you're going to be a dream client to work with. And I said, I you know, I was getting ready for a real real ego stroke. So I was like, oh, why? Because of my sparkling. My Denzel like looks, you know, and and, <laughs> and 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 what she said was like, oh no, you gotta understand. Some of the authors I work with, I have to tell them to wash. So suddenly I was oh. less. I felt the praise had kind of shrunk in its value. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that. You're you're yeah, killing me with exactly. kindness here. It's Look, uh, we're running out of time. Right. I gotta say, I gotta pitch to you your mystery books that yeah. you're gonna write. And y- okay, but. But here's, but how many, I just want, I have yes. three more questions yes. about Attack on Titan. How many episodes per season do you like think? I think it's like 20 or so, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So 20 times 20. That's some, that's some real time. 20 times and five. Then, and then there's a, br- and then the four, the, the, the season four, final season, another 20 t- Yeah. So, episodes. you know, you got like, there must be 80 to, like, there's a little bit more per season. So maybe it's like up to a hundred. And weirdly enough, they're all numbered. Like when you watch the show. It'll actually give you the episode number, okay. which is weird. Uh, so non fans yeah. will, yeah. So one yeah, through a hundred like or whatever. Yeah. And I think you might even. I think there's okay. a s- title as well. But it's it's it is it's absolutely worth watching, even with your revulsion for horror and stuff like that. You another great thing about it is after the first episode, there's also a great deal of really earned character humor in the show. So it it is it will make me laugh. So it's not sort of stupid. You know, set up, punchline, awful sitcom stuff. It's like actual earned humor. No. Okay. Ooh. There's the uh, Minister Faust has uh, introduced me to a new term, which I think is correct earned humor. Uh, okay. Now, we have, yeah, we have, you can tell me if you want to tell everyone yes, what I, I should I'm write. Tell Let's everyone. hear it. We can and, do it you all. Know, yeah. And of course, this, okay. this is yours to keep whether or not you take my courses. Okay. So, Okay, Philip K. There Dick, we go. the great science fiction author, also deranged sure. man who tried to kill two of his wife. A mess. A mess of a, of a person. But told her to re the last wife to re up the uh to make sure that she kept uh it didn't oh, fall into public domain. With the estate. That was one of the things that he yeah. yeah. Because he said thirty years from now they're gonna make movies out of all of my books. Yes. And they did. And the movies are easier to watch. Then the books are the, to read. There are some there excellent ones in the mix. And uh, one that's really bizarre that is uh, probably not an easy read, but it's one of my personal favorites called Valis. And Steve and, and Philip K. Dick is a character in Valis. Okay. So he is in the okay. book. I'm saying to you, you as a stand up comic should be the detective, not a, not a detective working for the cops. Oh. You should be a stand up comic yourself in the stories in which you, and there's lots of Armenian stuff. Because as a guy who knows nothing about <laughs> Armenian culture, I would just absolutely dig being thrown into that world, Armenian-American experience. I've right. interviewed David Barsamian. He's the only other uh, Armenian I've had a chance to Armenian interview. Armenian that yes, you and offhand. Yes, and I'm not interviewing you, sure. but it kind of, you know, it, it's a good conversation. Anyway, and then sure. you ha- there's cameos from your various friends, Laurie Kilmartin and, and everybody else. Bamford, Bamford, sure. Like, what a selling point for anybody who wants to actually uh, read these books, which are easily then turned into a TV show because you've got all these other people to mix in, and along the way you're on the road and you're solving crimes. <laughs> There's a there is a genre of stand up comics who do who are doing like um, road solving crimes on the really? road, sort really? of like the Hulk, who goes to yeah. There's a couple of those. But yours would and be better. Then, here's Mine would be better. Uh, the only problem that, uh, and this, 
this is hard for me to admit, but it's you, but I'm on the dork forest, so I can admit anything. Uh, there's just this, the 11,000 of us sitting around here listening. So it is that there is a thing in Los Angeles where you're supposed to pretend to not want to <laughs> be famous and want, and you're also to pretend that you don't care if anyone likes what you do. Uh, but I will say this is that this is a great idea because I've always, when I was a kid, I used to play something that I called imagination. And what I would do is I had to clean the, I, I was the youngest, so I had to clean uh, very little, right? Uh, I didn't have a hard thing to clean, but it always ended up in the basement where I had to sweep the basement and dust the washer and dryer. And, uh, the furnace was there and the furnace was my time. <laughs> machine. And I, And I was far too old to be playing imagination. My parents thought that I was nuts. And because I think I was a 12, 11, 12 years old. I didn't have any friends. And I was downstairs playing. What if Tarzan ended up on the on on Star Trek? (laughs) And what if Indiana Jones had a young girl sidekick? You know, you know how you always have to because there were no except for Marion, who, of course, was a, a pederast's delight, which was in the original pitch. Because Marion was originally supposed to be 14 when she and Indy had a relationship. Rel- sorry, in quotation uh, marks. I don't enjoy. Yes, I don't enjoy uh, an older man who likes to fuck older children. Uh, they're still children. Leave them alone. Uh, you don't get to touch everything. I'd be happy How to introduce that? them to a you nice timeshare in hell. Yeah. And you know what you want you want a 15 year old to do if they if they're if they can get it. Another 15 year old to touch him. Holy smokes, how much would I have loved to have had another 15 year old to get involved in this when I, I was 15? I, I, I was yeah, enough of but, a of a uh, overly romantic, sentimental sap that just the image there's uh, of, a, of <laughs> there's a there's a in Canada we have this thing called vignettes, which was these little little tiny mini movies that would run between shows that hadn't gone long enough they couldn't sell ad space by the National Film Board, and there's one of a okay. Quebec girl. And uh, so she's a French speaker. And then there's a like an Ontario boy who speaks English. Maybe they're in Montreal. And they see each other at the roller rink because you and I are of the generation to have roller rinks. And then roller they rinks. are seeing each other from a distance. And finally, the big climax is that the, he skates out. He can barely skate. And then they t- they hold hands and they skate around. See, that to me, that is the ultimate in 15-year-old romance. <laughs> I don't want anything with... That's because you have children and you're like, I have uh, 15 nieces and nephews and I have told them since they were children, don't <laughs> tell me. I would. Here's what I would love you to do. Wait until college for drugs, sex, yes. all of the things, and then never tell me. And then invite me to whatever hand fasting you're about to go through when you decide to do anything like that if you do. Uh, but no. I don't need to know. Uh, but live your lives. And uh, congratulations. But I would like it if you would wait to drink and do drugs until you were in college or at least 18. And then uh, and then sexy times as well. And then if you need uh, any sort of condom, let me in on that. I'll hook you up. Jimmy hats. But uh, yes. To bring it back. Yes. Yes. J. The I. Oh, that was that was very nice. That's actual quoting for the audience who doesn't know. You were just bringing Karis one actually rhyming like him into the conversation, which I appreciate tremendously. One afternoon <laughs> around 11 o'clock. We were standing on the cold. block. I was standing down the block. <laughs> Selling Chiba, Nixon, and Santa dimes. Rhyme just to pass anyway, the time. Minister- yes, Minister Faust. Everybody, go to ministerfaust.com. There will be a link in the, in the, in the notes. Uh, we have been talking about anime. There are other dorkdoms. I got a long list. But if you go to ministerfaust.com, you can take his uh, creative writing class. You can buy his books. You can take a look at those novels and see if they would interest you. Yes. And then you can buy them because uh, then he would make money and things would be good. Uh, oh, Canada, this has been <laughs> super fun. Thank you so much for doing Thank the show. Thank you for having me on. Big fan. Love your work. Can't wait for there to be even more of it. Plus, I have to read these mystery novels that you're going to do and then watch the streaming series and play the video game. I'll, ooh, the video game. And thank you so much for listening to the show, Rangers. You know the rules out there. Take care of each other. Hi, Adal. How was the show? It was super fun. It was with Minister Faust, who's not his real not name. His real name. <laughs> And he's not really a minister. He isn't a minister. He is not? No. He said, you know, people ask me that, and it's just that they would ask me that, because it's not my name. And people should ask me, are you a minister? 
And I am not a minister. It's he said, $20. Oh, he could actually. He could become a minister. I sent him $20. That's what you get for doing the dork forest. You get 20 we could, bucks. We could just sign him up. Oh, let's do it. Minister Faust is Canadian. Okay. And in the anime. Well, I don't know if it works in Canada. Oh, I'm right. sure it does. They have the internet. But let me tell you that we we talked anime. Right. And he had, I did not know that there was part of um, Studio Ghibli. Uh-huh. Pardon me while I fix the headphones. Of course. Uh, Studio Ghibli that the, uh, there was another guy besides Miyazaki. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that until yesterday when you... You had you heard of out. these movies. I had heard of these movies, but I but I did not know that they were Studio Ghibli movies. Okay. So, Pom Poco mm-hmm. is about uh, raccoon dogs. They call them raccoon dogs. They are raccoons that fight back for the environment. I think raccoon dogs are a different thing than raccoons. Oh, he said raccoon dogs. Oh, but raccoon dogs might be real? I think raccoon dogs are a real thing. Okay. They call them and that in the movies. Right, right. And they're, they're a different species of thing than raccoons. Okay. Or dogs. Okay. And uh, it's essentially the rats of Nim decide to not just steal electricity, but to tell people that they're uh, not really good at uh, having an environment. I kind of want to see that one, even yeah, though I all would. three of these sound super sad. Right. The other one, Grave of the Fireflies, <laughs> we know is very, very sad. That's the one I accidentally gave to Salmon. Right. Who did the ranger design? Yes. When he was eight. Yes, and he was very sad. He was very sad. He said, well, it was beautiful. We should always watch movies before we give them to kids. <laughs> that's right. That's the, that's the takeaway from that one. Right. And Princess Kagu- Kaguya, I, I uh, can't pronounce it. Kaguya. It's Kaguya of a sort. And But, but that I was a- I don't know that one at all. Well, that one is an old parable about attachment and Buddhism. Oh, okay. And then some s- sort of debunks Buddhism in the end. Oh. Uh it's a it's another sad one. And so I don't know. And then and then we talked about Attack on Titan. Oh yes. And not Studio Ghibli. No, but he said there's essentially a hundred episodes. Mm-hmm. And if I can get through the first six No. <laughs> no. It's not gonna have it's too the big <laughs> the big people eat the little people, and I don't like it. Right. He said that, but he did use a term that I thought was very fun, mm. uh, which was uh, Attack on Titan has what he called earned humor. Earned humor. Yeah, it wasn't like sort of phoned in or it wasn't just sort of gross or okay. wasn't just. So what is earned humor? Earned humor is built from the character. Oh, character humor. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I like that he was like, the, the jokes are sort of earned through character development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah, that I was mean, really. That's, that's what makes a lot of the. Show, a, a lot of the shows that we love work work yeah and right? a lot of the books too and a lot of the comic books it's mm-hmm. one of the things that i like about john allison's comic books oh right that guy yeah yeah cuz uh, all of his all of that humor is all character based okay well and then he also said that grave of the fireflies has this gene column art okay and i couldn't the 80s 90s the art, uh, an artist that was uh, that I thought is you a, might have known is he a comic book comic artist? book artist? It's of... not column. It's it's colon colon. Okay. C o l o n. O c o l o n. C o l o n. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, he said it was like that. Yeah, yeah. It's all. It's he did a lot of spooky spooky comic books. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, horror. 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 And, <laughs> and sort of uh, sort of spooky spooky superhero stuff. This is uh, now. These are dramas. All four of these things that we ended up talking about. Yes. And we're coming into October, which is spooky times. Spooky time. But I don't know that these are Halloween necessarily. Uh, no, probably not. I mean. They're just dramas. They're, and they're not spooky, right? No. They're just no. dramatic. Yeah. You could watch them anytime you wanted to be sad. <laughs> <laughs> or be filled with tension, which is what it sometimes do, does for me. Uh, but uh, everybody, ministerfaust.com. He has he has novels that he's written. He's like you should read the read the description of them. See if you would like any of them because I would like you uh to to like them. And I was like I will do that just to see because I read any number of I read a lot of different kinds of books. Yes. So it might be might be the book for me and it might be the book for you guys. So I will say that and then I will say goodbye. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. We, why don't we just call that as the end of the show?